Welcome students to the fascinating world of toxicology, where we'll explore the science behind the pollutants and toxins and their effect on living organisms. Expect to learn in this class the history of toxicology, as well as the toxicokinetics and the toxicodynamics. My name is Tommy. I am a human nutrition student and researcher at the university. What I do in these type of videos is to synthesize what I learn at the university, so then I can explain and teach you the best and most valuable information you need to know. Let's begin by talking about the history of toxicology. So as an introduction, we have the definition. Toxicology comes from toxicos, which means poison, and logos, that means study. So it is the study of poisons. Toxic is a chemical substance that creates an alteration in a living organism. A xenobiotic is a foreign chemical that can cause harm to a living organism. Is something that we do not produce in our bodies. And food toxicology is the study of xenobiotics toxic effects in human and also animal food. So the history, it started with the use of plants, of course. The main reasons were also assassination, poisoning and warfare using toxins and poisons. Paracelsus, he said, the dose makes the poison. This is the main thing to remember from the history of the toxicology. Paracelsus, the dose makes the poison. Then we had Ophila et Roger. These are considered the founders of modern toxicology. Then another important character was Bernardino Ramazzini. He is the father of walk toxicology. There were a bunch of new discoveries during world wars on these toxins such as some poisons, gas poisons, biological warfare. And then we have Arnold Lehman. He is the FDA founder, and they regulate the toxins and toxicology of food, mainly. Food and Drug Administration. So, sciences. We have different types of sciences. Basic sciences, which can be analytical or experimental, or applied sciences. Applied sciences means that we can apply the toxicology in various areas. As you can see, forensic is used to solve crimes, clinical, environmental, and inside of environmental, a very important one, the food one. Occupational, so Bernardino Ramazzini. Veterinary, medical, drug addiction, organ-specific science, and also regulatory science or the law. So what is the toxicity then? Toxicity is the intrinsic quality of a substance and it depends on biotransformation, defense, physiology, and chemical ratios. From the toxicity, we can obtain the toxicity potential of a substance. Then from that, we can have the risk. The risk is the probability of creating toxicity. And we can classify the risk using risk epidemiological studies. We will for sure, have a video talking about this. And in the risk, we have the dose-effect ratio and the dose-response ratio. The dose-effect ratio compares the damage and the concentration. So at what concentration do we have this effect on the body? Whereas the dose-response ratio is in charge of the population. So at what dose does the majority of the population get this effect? And by doing that, we can also identify hypersensitive and hypersensitive individuals. And we use a Gauss bell for that. And of course, this data comes from the risk epidemiological studies. And then we have the homotins. So these are substances that can give us a little bit of benefits when taken in small doses, but they become toxic when we excess the dose. This is indeed the principle behind the medicinal drugs. So now let's talk about toxicokinetics. Here we have four stages mainly. The absorption of the toxin, the distribution of the toxin, the metabolism and the elimination. So if you have watched my videos on pharmacology, you are probably know these steps. They are called pharmacokinetics and uh, they are summarized as LADME because in the pharmaceuticals, we also have the liberation step. So it's very similar. Absorption, phase of exposure. It can be physical availability, frequency of exposure, and xenobiotic dose. So it varies on the availability, frequency, and dose. Always dose. Ways of exposure, through the water, food, air, or soil. 
and uh, the ways of absorption are through the skin, respiratory, or through the mouth, oral. The dermal absorption, we have the skin, it's a strong barrier, but not strong enough to block everything. So the rate of absorption depends also on the part of the body, being the scrotum, followed by the armpit, the back and the abdomen, the parts of the body where the absorption is higher. The xenobiotic entries, such as phosphorus pesticides and organochlorine pesticides, these two are the main toxics that can go through the skin. The DDT is a very known one. It depends on the blood flow of the area, the size, the temperature, the hydration of the skin, more hydration, more absorption, and the integrity of the skin. If we have a wound, then the absorption is going to be higher. Respiratory absorption, we have the alveoli, then the capillaries, and the circulation. So you have to know that nose breathing is always better than mouth breathing, because we retain a lot more toxins in our nose than we do in our mouth. Therefore, the absorption of toxins is going to be lower if we breathe through the nose. And here we have to talk about partial pressures, Dalton's Henry's law, the concentration, the solubility, the plasma protein binding capacity. These are all factors that determine the absorption of the toxins through the respiratory tract. The gases don't go through the liver and there is no treatment available. You have to understand that this is one of the most crucial ways to be intoxicated. This is why they banned the gases they created during World War. It is a very fast way of intoxication. And the toxicity is calculated using Haber's constant. And it is the concentration of the toxicant multiplied by the time of exposure. So if there are a lot of toxic compounds in the air, the best thing you should do is to run away as fast as you can. But they can become chronic with very low concentrations. For example, carbon monoxide is a very toxic compound that replaces oxygen in the hemoglobin and leading to the sweet death. But if it's in very low concentrations, you're not going to feel it. And then we have the oral absorption. So there is a passive diffusion here and it can lead to systemic effects. You have to remember that ingestion is not equal to absorption. Why? Because not everything we ingest, we end up absorbing it. What increases the absorption is the high concentration and solubility of the toxin, as well as high vascularization of the gastrointestinal tract. What lowers the absorption is food. When we eat, we can lower the absorption of many toxins. Think about alcohol, for example. Also, higher gastrointestinal speed, which means less contact time, less time in contact with the intestine will decrease the absorption. Having enzymes that destroy or try to manipulate these toxins will decrease the absorption. Food interactions will decrease the absorptions and our gut bacteria will also try to protect us. What are the mechanisms of absorption? Diffusion mainly, filtration, active transportation and endocytosis by invagination. Diffusion is the main one. Fick's law of diffusion. The diffusion speed is equal to the penetration speed multiplied by the surface area, the concentration gradient, divided by the thickness of the membrane. The thicker the membrane is, the lower is the diffusion speed. Solubility. So a higher distribution coefficient means that there is a high fat solubility. And high fat solubility equals higher absorption. So if something is fat soluble, it's very high absorbable. An ionized form, either strong acids or strong bases, is polar. Therefore, is hydrosoluble, water soluble, and the absorption will be lowered. When we find non-ionized forms, weak acids and bases, they are in non-polar form. Therefore, low water solubility, higher fat solubility and higher absorption. Just remember that water is polar. So if they are polar, they are hydrosoluble and the absorption is lower. And the reverse also happens. Transporters competition always wins the substance in higher concentrations. Always. Doses. Again, the dose makes the poison. Then we have distribution. Monocompartmental or multicompartmental. It can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. 
It depends on penetration capacity and tissue affinity. The factors are the liposolubility, fat soluble, is higher absorption, protein binding, chemical reactions, ionization, the age, sex, weight, body surface area, especially weight, pathologies and physiological state of the individual. Xenobiotics in free form pass the blood-brain barrier, very important in the free form. There is a weak binding to the plasma proteins for easier unbinding and tissue penetration. So they are transported through the blood using these proteins and there is a weak binding to those so it is easier to unbind and be in the free form to actually pass the blood-brain barrier. And these are the plasma proteins we are going to use. Albumin, for sure, transferrin, ceruloplasmin, and also the alpha and beta lipoproteins. Accumulation, how it can happen by fixation or accumulation in a specific tissue or based on the localization at or away from a specific site of action. And these are some ways of distribution. Then we have the metabolism. These are the phase one and two reactions. And it is going to be discussed in toxicodynamics. Elimination, lungs, feces, bile, milk, also nails and hairs, urine, saliva, tears, and sweat. These are all the ways we have to get rid of toxins, which is very good. The factors, kinetics of elimination, contaminants, substance, the time of absorption, age, sex, weight, body, surface area. So these are the factors that determine how we're going to eliminate those toxins. Renal excretion. We have the renal clearance, which equals to the excretion rate divided by the concentration of the toxicant in the plasma. We have the different parts of the nephron where we can get rid of many toxins together with also minerals and other drugs. When the clearance value is below one, it is a passive clearance. When it's over one, it's an active clearance. Water solubles excretion only in the kidneys. Then biliary excretion. It is related with phase two reactions. We have the drug that enters the gastrointestinal tract, goes to the liver, and through the enteropathic cycle, it gets back to the intestinal tract. Because of this mechanism, we can have a risk of reintoxication. And here we get rid of the fat soluble toxins. Pulmonary excretion, it's a simple diffusion, lower solubility, higher elimination speed, and also breast milk excretion. So be careful with that. It's a very risky way for the infant, and it is full of fat soluble toxins, which are the worst ones. Bioavailability, it's the quantities of absorption and utilization, and also the speed towards the receptors. When there is a bioequivalence, it is because the absorption and the quantities that reach the receptors are the same. We can have an absolute bioavailability, which compares blood levels and urinary excretion of toxins, and a relative bioavailability, which compares the toxins absorbed through the same way. And now let's talk about toxicodynamics. This is the biotransformation. The goal is to make a xenobiotic more polar, because polarity equals water solubility and renal excretion, which is our main way of excretion. The factors, genetics, accumulation, prolongation and hypersensibility of toxins. The species, phase two reactions are qualitative. Phase one reactions are quantitative. Also sex, diet and environment. Phase one reactions, oxidation, reduction and hydrolysis. These three main reactions. They create active or non-active, but possibly active polar groups. Oxidation. The goal here is to add one oxygen atom and to create water using the cytochrome P450 and therefore increasing their polarity. So what do we do here is, for example, in the microsomal reactions, we have the hydroxylations, aliphatic, alicyclic, or aromatic. Epoxylations, including O2. And when we use O2, we create an adduct, which is a covalent binding to the molecule. The alkylations, when we remove an alkyl group and we bring an oxygen to the molecule. Oxidative deamination, this is an aromatic group plus an amine that will form an hydroxylation. And then the oxidative dehalogenation, this is basically to remove halogens from the molecule. 
the non-microsomal, so amine oxidation, monamine or diamine oxidase, creation of histamine. Histamine is involved in here. And oxidation of alcohols and aldehydes using dehydrogenases, for example, alcohol dehydrogenase. And then we have reduction reactions. This is the capture of electrons. We have the enzymes with nitro and azo groups. And the nitro are basically anaerobic conditions, NADH and nitrobenzene that will create an aniline. Whereas azo groups, azo dyes, azo reductases that create two amines. So the goal here is to capture electrons. Hydrolysis then. Here, no energy is required. We use water to split the molecule. Xenobiotics with ester or amide bonds are the main targets here. The esterases will create acid and alcohol and amidases, acid and ammonia. And then the phase two reactions. These are the conjugation reactions. They create inactive polar groups inactive as you can see here they are active in the phase one here are definitely inactive polar groups they act after the phase one reactions normally and this is to ensure the molecular polarity so how to do a phase two reaction we need a transferase enzyme a donor agent and energy type one the agent is activated whereas type two the substrate is activated in the type 1, we can have a conjugation with the glucuronic acid and an oxygen structure using UDP as a donor agent, or a conjugation with a sulfate anion and uh, PAPS, phosphodenosine phosphosulfate and OH groups of the xenobiotic molecule, of course, conjugation with methyl groups and S adenomethionine together with the aromatic amines, phenols, and thiols of the xenobiotic. Conjugation with acetyl groups and acetyl-CoA as a cofactor and the aryl amines of the xenobiotic. And conjugation with glutathione and the halogenated compounds we can find in xenobiotics such as DDC or other halogenated pesticides. Type 2, the substrate is activated, mainly amino acids. So there is a conjugation with amino acids and uh, xenobiotics with carboxyl groups. Or we can have an acid-CoA ligase enzyme and an N-acetyl transferase enzyme that would do the job for us. The elimination is through the urine, mainly, using the type 2. Here, as you can see, we have the phase 1, metabolites, polar species, renal elimination. Phase 2, stable adducts, no polar species, by their elimination. But some of those, the phase 2 reactions that are type 2, so activate the substrate, amino acids, they can go to the renal elimination as well. And the phase one reactions can also go to phase two reactions via conjugation. Okay, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new today with me. If you have any doubts, there is a comment section down below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel and share it to your friends and family to spread this knowledge to them as well. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one where we will talk about the toxicology, etiology, factors, and toxicological evaluation. Ciao!